In the heart of the Eiffel Mountains, a beast was awoken, filled with a stretch of twists, turns, climbs, and cliffs. It is a true test of man and machine. For almost 100 years, it has seen some of the greatest races in history. but has also been the scene of some of the deadliest accidents in motorsports. Its challenging and unpredictable nature, combined with dense forests surrounding the track, has earned it a nickname of the Green Hell. Many have tried to tame the beast, but few have succeeded. For decades, it has been a proving ground for the bravest and most skilled drivers in the world claiming the lives of countless racers and spectators who dared to challenge the unforgiving monster. Today, it continues to be a mecca for motorsports enthusiasts, in a place where legends are born and many are buried. Today, we look back at the history, carnage, and pure insanity that is the Nürburgring. Let's travel back in time, way back like start of the automobile back. Depending on who you ask, the birthplace of the modern car is Germany. And you know how it goes. Give man a tool and they'll use it to compete with each other. And this new tool was called auto racing and it was starting to become a huge hit. Kaiser Wilhelm in the early 1900s was totally on board with this new fangled thing. And he said he wanted to build a new racetrack, but ended up in World War I instead. Now that sucked, but at least after the war, Germany's auto industry took off in a big way. Car manufacturers were popping up all over the place. And those new car makers wanted a place to prove themselves. So what did they do? They dusted off old Willem's plan for a racetrack. It started in the hills of an old farming village that was starving for money. And it is here that work began on a paved piece of insanity. Nearly 18 miles of tarmac, crowned by a friggin' castle, and it was built by farmers with shovels in just two years. This winding, terrifying ring was etched into the soil. And it was all in the name of bringing in tourism and business for this poor town. Now, it was mostly constructed for manufacturers to test cars, but when it opened, it opened with a bang as the first race was held in 1927. And needless to say, it was good. At this time, Mercedes was dominating the track. Tourists were pouring in to watch from all over, and this great thing was getting even better. That is, until the Second World War. Those damn wars always seemed to get in the way. Luckily, war doesn't last forever though, so eventually in the late 40s, racing resumed on the ring. And the new hotness, Formula One chose the now famous Nürburgring as a premier spot to host the race. And this is where things take a turn for the worst. You see, a racetrack built in the 1920s is not a nicely manicured course. The pavement is rough and bumpy. The long straights encourage very high speeds, but there's also no runoff. There were just trees. So if you make a mistake, you end up in the forest. And not only are you now at the mercy of woodland critters, the ambulance might be 10 miles away. That level of extreme danger earned the ring a new nickname, the Green Hell. And as Formula One cars got faster and faster and faster, that nickname took a very dark turn. F1 started on the Nürburgring in 1951, and by 1969, five people had already lost their lives and countless others were severely injured. That prompted a bunch of changes to be made to the track. It was smoothed out and there was a wall put up so you didn't just pinball off trees. It wasn't enough. And in 1976, Nicky Lauda's Ferrari bounced off a barrier and burst into flames where it was hit by another car who couldn't see it due to that blind corner. Despite it being a favorite amongst the racing community, the ring was deemed too unsafe for Formula One. Now, that would be a death sentence for many tracks. But racing continued. Trucks, tourist cars, and motorbikes still could be found duking it out on the weekends here. And most importantly, 
companies were starting to use the ring for its original purpose. Showing off, of course. So here's the thing about the ring. It's a long course, and that means you can really test out the reliability of a car. It's extremely difficult, which means it's hard on components because the track just doles out brutal punishment to the ill-prepared. And this thing is half racetrack, half city road, and there can be multiple weather events happening simultaneously at different parts. All this combined makes it a perfect track for finding out if a car can actually go fast and last in the real world. So perfect, in fact, that the act of testing a car on the track became the competition. In the early 80s, rising stars in the auto world like BMW's M Division were out there bragging about how fast their cars could go around the infamous ring. This gave the track enough money to renovate the aging tarmac. Now, there was one major change that happened in the early 80s, and they were hoping to encourage F1 to come back. So they turned the South Loop into a GP track. They separated it completely from the North Loop, or the Nordschleife. Now, the Nordschleife is what most of us think about nowadays when we talk about the ring. It's still over 10 miles of green hell, with places for people with cameras and runoffs so you don't go into a ravine. Now in 1984, the ring was ready to reopen. So, of course they held a race. Now, the entire field was comprised of Mercedes 190Es. And to really make it known that they meant business, they invited Formula One champions to sit in the cockpits. The winner of the race, though, wasn't one of the champions. It was this new upstart driver, Ayrton Senna. Uh, yes, that Senna. With that, interest in the Nürburgring came back with a vengeance. Everyone wanted to be in the ring. And since this is actually a public road, they absolutely could. Now, that's always been true, but after the 80s and the rise of DTM, the little-known town of Nürburgring exploded into a car culture mecca. Here's how it works. Manufacturers want to test cars on the ring. That leads to competition. Competition leads to stuff breaking, which means industries have to be set up to fix the cars so they can keep driving. Now, people come to watch those races, then buy parts from those industries, which in turn gets them thinking, hey, I should try to start racing too. So they go tell all their friends, and suddenly the whole damn town is filled with wannabe race car drivers. Tuning shops are popping up all over the place, and rumor has it, some of the best tow truck drivers on earth live around Nurburg. Now it costs about 40 bucks, but anyone can get on the ring in any car. There's videos all over the internet of DHL delivery trucks, huge buses, and even mopeds getting down and dirty on the green hell. But maybe you don't want to ruin your own car? You can rent one, or take a taxi. The legendary Sabine Schmitz, who's now driving in heaven, used to take normal people for ride-alongs in purpose-built race cars, racking up thousands of laps at the ring per year and that earned her the nickname of the Queen of the Ring. Now, be careful if you decide not to rent. Crashing on the ring because you suck has serious consequences. Sure, it can hurt your pride and ego and scuff up your old BMW, but it's gonna hurt your wallet way more. Since you pay per every minute the track is shut down while they cart off your dumbass mistakes. That can be like $15,000 before you get the tow truck bill. I know, I know, you're going to do it anyways. I would too, because that's what the Nurburg is to us in the car enthusiast world. A place where we can go and drive on a track, test ourselves and our cars, all while being surrounded by some of the most brilliant engineers in the auto industry. On the days that there isn't a race going on and the public has been kicked off, it's those engineers who get to play. The testing and tuning never stops. And as the popularity of the ring grew in the 90s, so did the importance of the lap time. It became so much more than a simple pissing contest between these automakers. If you had a slow ring time, it was a slow car that no one wanted. In 2002, 
a Volkswagen Lupo GTI made the headlines when it nearly broke the 9 minute barrier. And that GTI set the bar. It was then that the race to break 8 minutes kicked off. Now, that was quickly destroyed just in a few years. In July of 2004, Porsche's Carrera GT would shatter that record by a minute and a half. And just three months later, the D8 RS from Donkervort would beat the Porsche with a time of 7 minutes and 18 seconds. The LFA, the Viper, and the Ferrari 488 would all push past the D8 and creep closer to the 6s. That is until Porsche came through with the 918 Spider, a hybrid that was the first to cross that 7 minute threshold. And they didn't stop. The Huracan pulled ahead of the Spider, then the specially designed Porsche 911s led the pack. An electric car almost took the fastest production lap ever, the Neo EP9, but it was outclassed yet again by another Porsche 911 trim, the GT2 RSMR. Now currently at the top is the Mercedes AMG 1, but we all know it's not going to last. Every car maker now has to prove themselves in hell. The GTR, which is Nissan's pride and joy, was developed for the ring. The LFA and the Viper ACR, Porsche's 911, Civic Type R, the Hyundai Veloster N, hell, even Range Rover likes to boast about their lap times. It's an integral part of car culture. And despite what some show hosts might say, a better yardstick for performance doesn't exist. In the quiet town of Nurburg with its quaint little castle, a racetrack was built. A track too deadly to race on. A track that was open to the public. A place where manufacturers gather from around the globe to see who can out-engineer who. Where the car enthusiast pilgrimage ends and the need for speed can be satisfied. A place where we ourselves can be tested. In the automotive world, there are qualifiers. Numbers that we use to compare ourselves and our cars to others. You know, like top speed, zero to 60 and the quarter mile. But none are as polarizing or as prestigious as a lap around the green hell. So what are your thoughts on the legendary Nürburgring? Do you think it's the ultimate test for machine and man? Let me know in the comments below. If you made it this far, I definitely appreciate you sticking around. And let me know if you found any mistakes in the video. I'm always looking to improve. Subscribe if you want to be alerted on my next video. And be sure to check out the other videos on the channel. And I'll see you in the next one.